the very first time I tried it with a housemate of mine at the time, we were just doing bench press and doubled our normal volume. You know, if we were doing five sets at a certain weight and that last rep was really hard to complete, did 10 sets the first time trying this and was just blown away. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Curious Competitor Podcast. My guest today is the founding members of Apex Cool Labs. I have Ariel Paul, a PhD physicist with me today, and Evie Lyons, uh, who has 20 years of expertise in marketing and will be uh, launching you know, full steam ahead into Apex Cool Labs here uh, with a very cool, um, I, I guess I'm overusing that term, cool, uh, product uh, to help training, which uh, as every listener of this podcast knows, I'm, I'm very into the first time I was introduced to, uh, palm cooling was through a teammate of mine who had listened to a human lab, uh, podcast. I'm, I'm a big fan of Andrew Huberman and, and, and his work as our Evie and Ariel. And, uh, there was a, a doctor out of Stanford named Craig Heller, uh, who kind of, uh, you know, greenlit this access to, you know, some of the studies he's been doing and Ariel with his, uh, you know, physicist background and Evie with her, uh, love for strength and conditioning. I, I believe you both met on on Twitter. Yep. We met on Twitter, yeah. So maybe we'll start there. The first time, you know, I thought, you know, a lot of the information was junk until I went ahead and, and listened to the podcast. And I, I you know, eventually uh, I do owe that teammate an apology. So I'll, I'll reach out in due time. I haven't gotten over my ego yet and, and uh, apologize. But um, take me back to that day on Twitter where you two uh, bonded over this uh, newfound tool uh, to take your training to the next level. Why don't you start with, and then I'll, I'll go yeah. into how it came together. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I heard the podcast. I immediately thought to myself, how is this not everywhere? How do I tap into these gains? I want to increase my pull-up volume by 144%. I want to gain strength 22% faster. I would consider myself an immediate level you know, weightlifter. And so, you know, gains have stalled and it's hard and you fight. And if I can fight and get a little bit more, that would be great. So I started hacking this based on some information in the podcast. Basically had a bucket of cool water in my garage gym. I was waving my hands through it. And I, I thought I could feel something, but I wasn't sure. And I also wasn't sure if I was doing it right. So I made a very embarrassing video of myself doing this. I think I'm wearing like a Broncos hat. You look like, great. I, it was ridiculous. I posted it on Twitter and I was like, am I doing this right? Anybody else out there trying to figure out this palm cooling thing, please help. And of course, crickets, no reply. And so I move on with my life. And three months later, I get this reply to this tweet I had sent months prior. And it was Ariel saying, hey, I have been playing around with this. I've built a prototype. It looks like you live in Colorado. Do you want to come and try this out? And so I said yes and drove over to his house in Boulder and proceeded to do more push-ups and pull-ups in his basement gym than I've ever done in my entire life and was simply blown away and was very, very excited when he sent me home with my own version of our V0, I'm yeah. not even sure what to call it, the prototype of this. And I was able to put it to use. I, I did a, I replicated sort of what they did in the Stanford study. So I did a, an eight week pull up protocol. I only did it once a week and I still increased my volume by 50% in those eight weeks with that first prototype. So I was hooked. And then, you know, Ariel continued to work on yeah. So prior to, to meeting Evie, I had heard that same podcast and, you know, the results, we should caveat a bit. They sometimes quote the outliers for those studies because, you know, it's a little more clickbaity, if you will, 300% increase. The gains are still insane that they have in these studies, but sometimes the outliers are what get quoted to kind of pull people in. But even the real results that are not outliers, the average results were still, they seemed shocking, right? So I went and after hearing the podcast, the podcast describes a lot of the results, but not really how do you do this? What are the mechanisms? What's the surface temperature you need? How much cooling power do you really need? So I started out by reading the papers to just try to get an idea. I mean, the nice thing about having been a physicist, you have access to all these 
publicly published papers, right? And you can go read, how did they do the studies? What equipment were they using? What temperatures were they using? And I went to my local hardware store and basically whacked together some copper pipes with a recirculating pump and got water at the right temperature in a cooler and was sending it through basically copper pipes that you could hold on to and was truly shocked at the results. The very first time I tried it with a housemate of mine at the time, we were just doing bench press and doubled our normal volume. You know, if we were doing five sets at a certain weight and that last rep was really hard to complete, did 10 sets the first time trying this and was just blown away. So said, wow, there's really something here and kind of perfected that copper pipe version and in that time, just started to get curious, are other people trying this out? And that's when I was on Twitter and, and saw Evie and said like, oh, this would be great. But then after the copper pipe version that was with the recirculating pump, I was like, this works, but it's not very practical in terms of bringing to the gym. So I have a lot of friends in the climbing community. I do some climbing myself and thought, could I make something that you could really bring, could be truly portable, bring to the crag, bring to the gym. And after I made that, first prototype that really sort of worked in the portable sense, what we call these days the narwhals. I brought Evie a pair since she had been such a dedicated field tester of the original version. And that's kind of where our company idea started to take off. Yeah, I love it. So, so then the, the second person I ran into palm cooling uh, with was Austin Einhorn, who I understand is, is kind of a, a loosely affiliated with you guys. You're more friends than a, a paid sponsorship you know, sort of agreement. He's worked with you know, all sorts of MLB uh, players, all sorts of uh, NHLers, NFLers. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, James Van Riemsdyk, works with him and has spoken, you know, volumes about his work. And I've loosely followed him. And uh, I, in my understanding, uh, you know, seems to be a, a very sharp guy. And he was sort of the second champion uh, for this work. And what really piqued my interest was I am very temperature sensitive. This is something you recognize as a hockey player. You know, for one, we've got all this gear on, right? And, and so our, our temperature rises very quickly. Um, I'm a heavy sweater, so that, that's kind of like a, a, a second, um, you know, sort of sign that I'm someone that really responds to the heat, you know, especially especially as games go on. The third one being when certain rinks get hot. So I know as a fan, you know, maybe you think it's like the same atmosphere every night. It's not. You know, I was playing uh, for the Charlotte Checkers in the American League at the time. It's not an NHL quality rink. They're not really making sure the doors are closed at all times. Like when it's 100 degrees outside, it's quite hot in the rink and it's brutal uh both the the ice is softer so you know there's less glide it's more work to get places but definitely uh that temperature rising so what is it about temperature in general that is such a limiting factor um in exercise and something as simple as you know say uh, you know doing an intensive uh you know push-up or bench press or pull-up you know volume versus something that's maybe a little more complex nervous system wise you know playing the game of hockey at full speed in in you know a professional environment there are multiple effects there, right, that are correlated with temperature. So if we go really broad brush, your core body temperature, when you exercise, pretty much no matter what you're doing, your muscles are just not very efficient. You are between about 20 and 25 percent efficiency in your muscles, as in the energy it actually takes to physically move them, you know, three, four times more is getting dumped into heat. Your anatomy your skin, muscles, fascia, fat layer, they're all very good insulators. So once that heat is starting to build up, it is very difficult for your body to get rid of, right? And sweat is an amazing way that it can help, evaporative cooling can help reduce your temperature. But as you're exercising, so your core body temperature is gonna rise, that's well correlated with heart rate. So as your temperature rises, your heart rate is going to increase, your sweating rate is going to increase, you're losing fluid, you're losing electrolytes, all these things are compounding to inhibit your performance. And then on a cellular level, when you're doing something like bench press or intense push-up workout, the claims from Stanford are there is an enzyme known as muscle pyruvinate kinase, which is locally involved with the production of ATP in your muscles. And if you remember from sort of high school biology, there's that lock and key sort of picture of how enzymes work. And when your muscles are getting locally hot, which they can go up to, I think it's 102, 103 degrees pretty easily in something like a push-up workout, that enzyme starts to deform. 
And as it deforms, it's not going to produce ATP as well. So this is why one of the main mechanisms, you do a whole set of push-ups till failure. You can't do another one, but if you wait some time, you can, that energy production system kicks back in, you can do more. And one of the ways it's thought of is sort of a safety mechanism. If you could just keep going, your muscles would basically cook themselves. You could get cellular damage. So your muscles and your cells are much more tolerant to cold than heat. Interesting. So there's kind of those two, there's that kind of overall core body temperature and that local muscle heating. And then my understanding of the, of the palm cooling is it's both the bottoms of our, of our feet and, and through our palms where we're tending to lose a lot of our heat. And this is why the narwhals are such an effective tool. Am I understanding that properly? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet and, and also the cheek region, basically anywhere where there's no hair naturally occurring. Um, I don't know what, yeah. Artificial hair would be, but anyway, um, these areas are known as glabrous skin, and they have a special vasculature within them that is called uh, arteriovenous anastomoses, or AVAs. AVAs are direct connections between veins and arteries, and it makes sense you kind of have them in places where blood is turning around in your body. And these areas, when we are exerting ourselves, have 10 times as much blood flow as other skin regions. And so because of this, uh, in fact, their, their purpose is presumed to be simply the, the transportation of heat and is one of the, the ideas of why we have these AVAs in the first place. And so basically, the palms of our hands are excellent radiators for our body. We can onload and offload heat very quickly through these. So you can do palm warming if you're cold. Uh, which will heat up your core body temperature. I've done it myself when our basement uh, facility was a little cold and my feet got cold and I just filled the narwhals up with uh, warm water. But you obviously you can, you know, the, the, what we're here to talk about is palm cooling. And so you can cool your core body temperature very quickly, very effectively, simply by, by cooling the palms. And it's very interesting, I think, in hockey where you are heavily insulated this was something that researchers have studied as, as a lot of these things are developed, you know, come from uh, potential military applications. And so there were studies of uh, where they had people wearing heavy layers of military equipment and they were exercised until they were at feverish temperatures. And then they used palm cooling and, and feet cooling, actually. They used both to see how quickly they could bring those individuals' core body temperatures down, their heart rates down. And it was dramatic, the difference that palm cooling could make even when you're wearing insulating gear. Yeah, I think the, the science, um, and for anyone that, you know, wants to listen to the Human Lab podcast, it is profound, uh, you know, some of the studies that they've done. But like, I was I was bringing this to a couple of teammates at the uh, gym uh, yesterday, you know, they were going through a workout more circuit style. Um, and I had them and I just want to show them my new toy. So I whipped my narwhals out with my name on them. And I, I looked cool. And I think they look great. And um, I just said, I'm like, hey, you know, Try this on for size. This is what I understand, you know, the science to be. I know it. It it, it sounds maybe like a like a tall order, but just let me know, you know, how you feel. And I was kind of running them through this analogy. I was like, you know, th these parts of our body are so sensitive, and and you know, me being very temperature sensitive, something that I'll do at nighttime, for example, is I'll drop the temperature down, you know, down to 67, 66 degrees in my room. But you know, there's some days maybe I forgot to turn it down, you know early enough. So it's, you know, still in the seventies. And then all of a sudden I'll like tuck my foot outside the covers. And I'm assuming a lot of people have had this experience. And then all of a sudden you go from too warm to, you know, out like a light. Right. And so I, I was trying to at least open the team, my teammates, you know, cause they were uh, healthily skeptical, I'd say, you know, to the notion that this might, you know, be something they could, you know, try on for size. And uh, I was using it with some of the bike sprints the other day. Um, I was doing like eight seconds on 52 off. So, you know, more anaerobic in nature, uh, you know, eight bouts. Um, and I was trying the palm cooling for the 52 seconds. It's a little clumsy, you know, cause I'm, you know, I, I got like a, a box next to me. I'm grabbing them. I noticed some effect, but it was really during that two to three minute block in between the two blocks of eight, you know, I did 16 reps total. That was where I would say like reps one through four on the second round. I, I really felt a degree of freshness. I, I didn't anticipate if I, if I hadn't had them with me. Yeah, the you're really pushing the the limits of what it can do with only sort of 60 seconds. You know, what we tend to find in both the studies and anecdotally is 
a minute and a half or more is really the sweet spot. Almost all the Stanford studies were done with about three minutes of cooling. 60 seconds just isn't quite enough in most cases. You know, it's better than nothing, I think, for recovering a bit of heart rate this and some of these other effects. But in terms of when we're doing any kind of strength training, we're trying to hit at least two minutes of cooling between reps. And if you're doing a heavy compound lift, you're going to want a pretty decent amount of rest between lifts anyhow. So yeah, 60 seconds, 52 seconds, especially it's, it's kind of really pushing the limits of, of what you can do there. But we would say in our experience, we tend to see 90 seconds or more. And then a great benefit, if you, if you haven't tried this yet, Evie can talk about her experience there. I've done it a bit with her is down regulation at the end of a workout. <laughs> yeah. So I also learned about down regulation via the Huberman Lab podcast and, and his conversations with Andy Galpin. And I am notorious for finishing a workout, grabbing my phone, responding to email, running, you know, up to my computer, getting online. And yeah, in the afternoon, I'd feel completely beat up. And I was wondering what, why, why do I feel this way? So I tried, you know, I heard about down regulation. I appreciated that I apparently only needed three minutes. That felt doable. So uh, at the end of a workout, I'll just lay down on the ground and do some slow breathing. I, you know, I try different techniques, box breathing or the physiological sigh, but basically just controlled breathing, close my eyes and hold on to the narwhals while I'm doing that. And one of the things that isn't well understood and hasn't been studied explicitly, but has been mentioned in some of the studies is that an extended palm cooling after uh, about, uh, you know, after your workout can reduce the symptoms of delayed onset muscle soreness. And so something's going on there. It would be fantastic to get more research done, but there is, you know, you're, you're bringing your core body temperature down, you're helping your body move into that recovery mode and you are allowing that heart rate to come back to a baseline by having that sort of extended cooling plus down regulation. So that's another, you know, interesting protocol to test out, see how you feel. I had a, I had a similar response, I think just through the, the cortisol, you know, being so high, I, I was a morning coffee drinker. I would not do, you know, Andrew Huberman's the 90 minute wait. I've worked on it, you know, 60 minutes, I start to get itchy. I'm like, I, and I, it's not even for the caffeine kick. I just love the taste of coffee and the, the warm <laughs> comfort in the morning is just, I'm so into it. I got like my pour over in the morning I, and I, I'm just sitting there staring, watching the clock. It's like watching paint dry. It kills me. Um, so bet between, and actually a, uh, I see a, a neurological wellness doctor here in Chicago who, you know, kind of, I do like pre-consultation. I even had concussion issues, but in case I did, I would, I would go with this mm -hmm. clinic and this was actually something that he recommended. He's like, uh, I, I want you to avoid this cortisol wave. You know, if I go and put 300 pounds on your back, you, your nervous system is going to respond. It's going to have a lot going on. Um, and similarly with coffee, similar if you're, you know, right out the door and training in the morning, these are all things that I, I generally do. Um, you know, so I, I've tried to avoid that. I too had uh, this afternoon bonking, Evie, where Post-workout, same thing, on to the next thing. You know, I got a two-year-old at home. I train, you know, hours and hours a day. It, it, you know, I'm usually trying to avoid traffic on the way home because I, I train in the city. It's about an hour from where I live. Um, and it would just lead to this total crash. And so I'm, I'm very interested to see what, you know, my response is. Even on the way home today, I was just playing with it, you know, while I was driving, holding one and then the other. I don't know if that's, you know, the, what the legality of that is, but... Yeah. You're not driving stick, probably. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I figure. But um, I don't know. I I, I think I know uh, Andy Galpin's really big on like at least taking two to three minutes post exercise, do some parasympathetic breathing. I noticed that to be a huge asset. Um, and I think using the palm cooling in addition to that, as I mentioned in the the beginning of this anecdote, is like. I feel like sometimes as athletes, we have no, I, no problem like stacking the stressful or stacking the bad. You know, it's like, I'm going to get up right away in the morning after six and a half hours of sleep. I'm going to train as hard as I possibly can. I'm going to have coffee before I'm going to have coffee after. Um, and, and you're, you're, you're really ramping up this sympathetic dominance. So, you know, why not be as creative with our rest protocols in terms of, uh, you know, getting back to baseline, maybe using some breath work, maybe, uh, trying on the palm cooling for size. And then it's the Dom's piece. There's been this movement in pro hockey to be very careful 
to induce DOMS from a weight training perspective. A lot of trainers have kind of gone uh, away from some traditional loading. And I think a lot of it has to do with the trainer doesn't want to put the hockey player through, you know, 48 hours of being really sore and altering, you know, sort of their skill mechanics. Yeah. But the, you know, the bone density, the, the hypertrophy, the, I don't know, you know, there, there's studies on this, but neurologically, I, I just feel more explosive when I feel the, the gravitational tension of, of external load. My body responds really well to it. I'm not sure everyone's like that. Um, but it's that Dom's piece that's been, uh, you know, a really scary thing to take on uh, for a lot of hockey players I know. Yeah, the, it's interesting. I think we've both experienced this and it, it can be a little lift dependent. You know, I think you probably know this if you're, you know, you've obviously been training hard and lifting a lot your, your whole life. Well, maybe not your whole life, but most of your life. And certain lifts, certain muscle groups, it's like, it just doesn't matter, right? I mean, you're going to get doms if you lift, lift those. I mean, and I think different people are different. Maybe it's pull-ups getting your lats. Maybe it's something lower body where you're like, oh man, if I do goblet squats, I am just, it doesn't matter. I'm sore. But I think both of us have experienced where you do certain exercises. And even if you are sore with those exercises that traditionally hit muscles and get you sore, it's nowhere near as bad as you would be for your normal volume that you were doing there. And I've certainly had a few where I've been shocked that there's almost none. But Yeah, the, the other piece I'm really interested in, you know, so like post-workout recovery, that seems to be like this magic window that a lot of athletes don't take very seriously that, you know, for hormonal health, for gut health, because a lot of times athletes are going into a meal, right? So we want to reach this parasympathetic state so we can actually digest our food, not just inhale it and, and, and not be able to extract, you know, what we need from it. Um, there's a gentleman named William Wayland, uh, who I, I haven't, I don't know him personally. I, I, again, follow him on Twitter. I, I find him to be a, a really sharp, um, uh, sport performance trainer out of England. And like one of the things that he was saying was a lot of his clients have older homes. This is, I don't think a very American problem, but I, I thought it was an interesting, you know, sort of case study. He said, uh, a lot of his clients have older homes without air conditioning. And so they really struggle to sleep in the summer because of, again, you want your core body temperature to, to dip. And something that he was recommending was having his clients run, you know, you don't want to maybe do a cold shower because it's, you know, an illicit sort of, um, you know, very energizing effect, but cool water on the hands and on the feet if they could, if they were taking a shower at the end. And I was really wondering if, uh, you know, there's any discussions around improving, you know, deep and uh, REM sleep using palm cooling, if that's anything you've heard of. I don't believe I've read anything. Have you? I, we've talked to a couple people with anecdotal reports. I think Brandon has mentioned mm -hmm. this. Some people have used this as a sleep aid. We're both very scientific and don't like to quote things that we don't have peer reviewed evidence for, but there's certainly some logic to that. You know, palm cooling can't really bring you below baseline, if you will. It can bring you back to baseline because of the natural mechanisms of your hands, the way those arteriovenous anastomoses work. If you start to dip below baseline, if you're getting cold, cold, you, they're going to vasoconstrict and you're just not going to conduct the heat as much. So it's more about bringing you back to baseline and, and kind of getting you on the path. So I think there may be some psychological effects there. Like you feel because you know that feeling if you're too warm, <laughs> getting to sleep is tough, right? So there may also be, you know, sleep is complicated, right? You could, if you're big into sleep, you know, sleep hygiene and what light you have and all these things where you're thinking about how can I maximize my sleep? So there may be some parts of that, which are also, if you know, you sleep better when you're cool, if you have that psychological feeling of cooling down, that may be an effect too. But I don't think that this is very well understood. I personally, like the thing that makes me sleep like a rock is getting in the sauna before bed. And that's the effect of by heating yourself up externally, you're getting your body's mechanisms for cooling you down to kick in faster. And then once you get towards bed, your core body temperature is lowering because your body's trying to drive it down. That works amazingly for me. So that, I actually think that that's a, a great way to hack a temperature protocol is don't put cool water on your hands, get in the sauna before bed, you know, actually get hot in a sense, because that will drive you to cool down. But. Now, are you more of a traditional sauna? Or are you an infrared sauna person? What's your style? 
So I'm traditional sauna for just these reasons is that the studies for sauna have been on traditional sauna. So the evidence is with traditional sauna. That doesn't mean that infrared saunas don't have some potential, but certainly the podcasts and evidence I've read about it say you really want to get the sweet spot, at least in the observational studies, is 174 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And for an exposure of 20 minutes for a, a, for the maximum benefit four times a week are the sort of the sweet spot numbers I've heard. And I don't think most infrared saunas get you there. So they feel great. I've been in them, but uh, I like to stick with sort of what's known and what's been studied well. There may one day come out good evidence for the infrared saunas, but I don't think it's quite there yet in observational studies because most of them are from Finland where they go traditional. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And this is kind of why I asked you the question about sleep, because, I, you know, I, I've listened to the same podcast from, you know, uh, Andrew Huberman, as well as other folk um, on the traditional sauna. I actually prefer the traditional sauna. I, I like the heat, but the two best uh, sports scientists that I've worked with have, you know, worked with, uh, you know, bonafide superstars in the NBA and in the NHL have both recommended to me at different uh, points and independently of each other to go infrared. They were much less interested in the actual core body temperature and much less interested in like the heat shock protein that people are after and much more interested in like the cellular stimulation and the mitochondrial stimulation of the infrared. So it's like, and I think a lot of this on their end is trying to understand the mechanism and making, you know, best guess on what they understand about physiology. And and so I, I, I you know, find the, the, the playing with this. And, and at the end of the day, we're all individual case studies, right? Like, I've listened to the same podcast about sauna before bed. I know Peter Atia. I've I've seen his you know Instagram posts about it. I don't respond well. I don't know what it is. There's like a sleep latency. I stay too hot too long after the sauna, and it 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 you know tends to bother me. I'm in bed uh, you know sweating. So like you know at the end of the day you know for the listener you know please try these things uh, on your own, and and even better if you have a doctor or a, uh, a a trainer that you trust to kind of guide you through these things. But at the end of the day, we we are. We are unique and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're more alike than we are different. You know, we're all the same species, but we have our nuance. Absolutely. I mean, look, you look at strength training studies and you can see they do the same strength. I've seen one where it was the same strength training protocol and some people gained 55 percent hypertrophy in their biceps and some people lost, got smaller. Like the range of response can be enormous. Right. So very cool. Well, well, here um there was one uh, mention I, I want to shore up. Uh, I was talking about uh, the narwhals with a friend, and, and he had mentioned, you know, I might just, you know, kind of jerry rig this with uh, like frozen water bottles for a while. What is the concern with having it too cold on the hands? Because I know this is something that you understand. Yeah, maybe I can speak to that, and you can speak to what to look for in a or how to design a hack. But if if you are holding on to something too cold, your AVAs will vasoconstrict and you will not get the blood flow anymore that you need. And so if there's no blood flow, you're not, you're not offloading the heat. You're not on, you know, you're not cooling your blood. And that is not then circulating into your muscles and impacting your heart rate, impacting the enzymes in your muscles. And so it just completely shuts down. So you really need to avoid holding on to something too cold. Most people will begin to vasoconstrict when you get into that, like, 50 degree Fahrenheit range. So you know, we designed the narwhals to maintain a handle temperature of about 55 degrees, which, which appears to be the sweet spot for most people. But there are certainly ways that you can design something on your own to test it out. And Ariel, maybe you can speak to some of the parameters that people should be paying attention to. Yeah, you know, there's this interesting piece where two points there. I don't understand the physiology behind this, but some people, especially when you're exercising hard, can go much colder. I think there are some mechanisms because your body's saying, I need to offload heat, I need to offload heat. So there are, are some neurotransmitters that allow you to vasoconstrict at much lower temperatures. So some people can handle quite cold, but that is rare. Uh, and we should talk a little bit about the difference between something feeling cold and something conducting a lot of heat away from you. So an experiment I suggest people do is open your refrigerator, go in there. Everything in there should be about the same temperature. Most refrigerators keep things at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit in your fridge and touch some things, touch the walls, touch a soda can, touch a glass bottle, touch a plastic bottle. 
All these things are the same temperature. They've all been in your fridge, but they will feel different temperatures. And that feeling of coolness, like on the, it's one of the reasons why in a sauna, you can sit on the wood, right? But if you touch metal in a sauna, it burns. I don't know if you've ever done yeah, that. Yeah, you're in trouble. You know, so if there's some little metal piece and you touch it, it will feel much, feel much hotter. It's all at the same temperature. Why is that? That has to do with thermal conductivity. When an object has a low thermal conductivity, it's not going to feel as cold because heat is not flowing from your hand into the object as quickly. When it has a high thermal conductivity like metal, like so you can be in the gym and touch a barbell, it feels cooler, even though it's all at the same temperature as the rest of the gym, because heat is flowing from your hand faster. So one of the problems is you might go, oh, let me go just fill a plastic water bottle with the right temperature, 55 degree water. It's not gonna last very long, it's gonna warm up, but whatever, let's say you're using that. It won't, it may feel reasonably cool, and at the right temperature, but the heat is not going to conduct away from your hand very well because it doesn't have a good thermal conductivity. So if you want to do a hack, probably the best thing you can do is get, you wouldn't want to use this. This is stainless steel and it's vacuum insulated, right? So even if you put cool water in there, it's not going to conduct heat away from your hand very well. So you can find single wall aluminum water bottles. Right, so aluminum, aluminum, good thermal conductivity. And then if you fill that with, you know, water from the, the water filler, those will be pretty cool. It's gonna warm up pretty quickly in the gym, but if you want something to try, that's gonna be reasonably effective. And the other thing we would recommend doing is shaking it because where you're holding it, it's gonna get locally warm. For this, in the same way, if you get into a cold tub and just sit there, you get a thermal barrier, right? You, you're not gonna be as cold, you need to agitate. So if you sit there with your aluminum water bottle and shake it, you're going to get that cooling effect better through your palms. The one, you know, the big inconvenience there is it's not very controlled and you're gonna have to re keep refilling it, especially in any sort of warm environment. But you should be able to see an effect from that. That's really helpful. And that's something I found cool about the Norwals, the, the copper, it does look cool, but it also, I can't believe like how long it'll stay cool, you know, through the workout and then, I mean, you did mention about the cold tub. Admittedly, I have a difficult time agitating. Um, I, I do like my little warmth cocoon. And right, I but I mean, that's out. what you get, right? The thermal barrier, it's nice, but it's its not helping conduct the heat away from you. It's not. And I, I mean, I kind of have a my mental state when I'm in a cold tub is it, it doesn't really begin until it stops hurting. Like that's when the cold tub that's when the timer really starts. And I was listening to the Muscle Intelligence podcast with uh, Ben Pakulski, who I had the luxury to meet uh, in Toronto. Really, you know, sharp guy. I followed his stuff for a long time. And he was documenting on his podcast a little bit about he, he was doing some of the fire and ice, the sauna and cold tub, uh, you know, for, you know, checking on inflammatory purposes, checking on his sleep. He tracks his HRV and all that. And one of the things that he said, you know, even as a world-class bodybuilder, like he has this intimate relationship with pain, you know, <laughs> really grueling sets, you know, high lactic threshold. And he said, this cold tub just does not get easier. He's done it every day for like 30 days is his goal. And <laughs> so I felt a little bit better about that. And, and I, I know, you know, the cold plunge, cold, cold's having its moment right now. You know, sauna is too, but cold's mm -hmm. really flourishing. And, you know, Abby, let's transition a little bit to the brand development side, because I, I, I really appreciate uh, your entrepreneurship story, you know, kind of meeting on, uh, you know, Tinder for entrepreneurs on, on Twitter there, just, you know, kind of <laughs> like, speed dating and being Twitter like, Hey, <laughs> you, you're into this stuff too. Let's do it. Um, you know, what, uh, you know, brands are, are you eyeing up that that's kind of entered into the, the wellness space and done a nice job and, and, and who do you see yourself, uh, partnering with, you know, sort of long-term here, uh, as the brand, uh, begins to develop? Yeah, that's a great question. I definitely feel like, for the last, you know, year. So we met, you know, we, we met over a year ago. Now, about a year ago, we created the company Apex Cool Labs. We launched our, our website and started selling in January. And up until uh, about 30 days ago, I had a full-time job leading marketing for a software company. And so, you know, and, and Ariel had a full-time job running user experience, I'm gonna get this wrong, but user experience for a scientific education organization. So we have been in truly bootstrap mode for a very long time and stealing time away wherever we could 
But from the very beginning, when we first decided to create this company, we spent a month taking these very long walks. <laughs> it was great uh, for fitness, general fitness, but we would go on these very long walks talking about what we cared about in terms of the, the company we were building and the brand we were building. And we got very clear on that. And we want Apex, first of all, we want Apex School Labs to be a company that is grounded <laughs> in science. We won't make claims like palm cooling is better than steroids, for example. We, we won't make claims that it can help you sleep unless there is this, you know, the, the research there. And we, you know, we know that this is odd and we know there's healthy skepticism out there. And so we want a brand that can build trust and it can earn trust. And you can only do that by being honest and, and also, you know, peeling back the curtain on this. So we have a blog post on how to hack palm cooling with the aluminum bottle, because we don't want people out there trying it with plastic and thinking this doesn't work. We don't, you know, or ice and not getting the right benefits. We want people to experience this, whether they buy the narwhals or not. We're very excited about the potential for palm cooling to push human performance to the next level. And I don't even think we've seen the beginning of this. So we're very excited about that. And in terms of a brand, you know, one of our company jokes is that Ariel's the brains and I'm the bronze. Because if you, if I walk by a mirror, I'm flexing. I love delts. Like I'm obsessed with delts and I would much rather be lifting than doing, you know, going out to the bar, right? There have probably been more <laughs> conversations about delts than most co-founders have ever had in the history of co-founding a company. It's embarrassing, but I am. I feel like it. I have an idea of your, of your training protocols too. It, it's like, you know, 50 sets of shoulder all week. And then, you know, every other Monday is leg day. And then it's just like six days of delts and pull ups. I'm I would never skip leg day, but uh, yes, I, there is definitely a lot. You know, well, the some of our equipment for hand building the narwhals is right next to the dumbbells, and so I've been known to sneak in a sets of, of delt raises while waiting for something to like run through our machine or something. So anyway, you know, we we I love muscle. I am a big proponent of more women getting into weightlifting. Uh, Ariel is the scientist <laughs> of this operation, but one of the things that we we really cared about was we we didn't want to build a fitness brand that came across too broy. We don't want to be out there saying if you're not using palm cooling, you're an idiot. Uh, we want we want to inspire you to use it. We want you to just feel the benefits. Do your N of one experiment. See how it impacts your training. See how it impacts your competition. And if it works for you, then go like awesome. And so that's really important to us. We want to be approachable and educational. And because we are, we will be quirky. We are quirky. We have a lot of fun. You'll see us in a narwhal onesie. We do lots of narwhal dancing because there's something about holding the narwhals that just inspires you to dance while you're resting. So, you know, we want to bring that level of quirkiness to our brand. And, and that's what we're building. We may have said we want to be the quirkiest fitness brand on the planet. We, we may That's on your vision board in the side of the gym. It's like you got the American flag and then like a picture of like a perfect set of delts, you know, on, on one wall. And then, you know, the mission statement with being the, the, the weirdest, quirkiest brand out there on the other. I, I got a picture in my mind. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, Ariel busted me today. I was looking at scrolling through, you know, Instagram and then this massive picture of Arnold appears on my feed and he's like, are you seriously like consuming this content? And I'm like, yeah, this is like, this is my feed. Anyway. So yeah, that, that's what we're trying to build. We have, uh, you know, brand building is a long effort and it's built through mostly through the community of the customers and the people uh, that are, are part of, you know, trust us and, and buy our product. And so that's what we're focused on right now in terms of brands that inspire me in the fitness space. I, would have to say that right now I'm addicted to and uh, really enjoying Element, the electrolyte company. I love their aesthetic. I think it's very cool. I appreciate their their content, their blogs around fluid loss, electrolytes, and things like this. I think they're taking on something that's really challenging. You know, we've had how many decades of the various uh, FDA telling us that we shouldn't have too much sodium and trying to shift that mindset. So I really, I, I admire them for that. Definitely something that I, you know, I look up to. 
Yeah, I, I like Element. I've I've been uh, I, I guess an ambassador. I, I got a code. I don't know what that makes me, but I have a code with them, and I I've loved their work. And Rob Wolf. That makes you an ambassador. That's, that's, that's I think that makes me an ambassador, right? I got a code. I, I, I made it. Um. But again, that was mostly born out of a heavy sweater. I take like two or three of those things a day, love them. Um, definitely find that to be, you know, something from a performance standpoint, something I didn't look at um, and, until I got a little bit older and worked immediately. And it's odd. I had this um, similar to being very heat sensitive. Like I remember in baseball, you know, it's, it's 100 degrees outside. Uh, I, I, I would catch. So I was wearing a lot of the gear. I would really struggle compared to a lot of my teammates. You know, like I, I remember you know, to be frank, bitching about the heat, you know, quickly and, and more often um, than them. There was this other sensation where, you know, I don't know if it was I was forgetting to eat or I was dehydrated. We'd be playing, you know, whatever game as a kid, uh, ghost in the graveyard or get to the stairs or hide and seek. And I'd be sweating. It'd be a summer day. And I would get to like this, this passing out point where I was like, I, I am need something saltier. I'm going to fall over, you know, and I'd go in the house and crush pretzels or chips or whatever kids eat, you know, Cheetos. And immediately, you know, feel better. And I don't think it was a, a glycogen or like a low blood sugar thing. I really think it was a, a salt loss. And so, I, you know, I have these memories. Oddly, I had uh, like sports-induced asthma as a kid. And I, now I want to go into like breath training. And so, so I'm kind of following all these, you know, long-lived threads in my life and, and, you know, trying to investigate a little bit about them, you know, all in the name of, you know, trying to live a better life and, and become a better athlete. And Evie, I really relate to um, this concept of just – Overall, improving the standard of health and fitness knowledge in the United States. Uh, I, I tell this story. I had a, a friend of mine who got married in the Czech Republic. And I went to a gym and uh, just a, a normal gym, big box gym. And I could not believe from like high school girl age to, you know, men in their 60s, the quality of lifting and like movement programs that I saw everywhere. And this is not to make fun of people in the U.S. I, I, I really wish them well and, and, and think that, you know, education would go a long way. I just think it was a part of their culture, like gym culture, uh, movement practice. I could tell that these people like knew what they were doing. Um, and what I really like about the palm cooling is I, I feel like this, you know, maybe not for someone as competitive as I am or even uh, as you two are. Fitness and feeling better, you, you really don't have to work as hard as you think. For most people, you have to work maybe more often than you think, like the consistency component, you know, does tend to be a real driver of results, but you don't need to, like most of your training should be easy. And if palm cooling is something that helps it feel easier so you can produce, you know, more work, uh, more sets, uh, you know, so there's more volume and a higher intensity, those would all be good things. Yeah. Your mom. You yeah. Your mom. Yeah. My, uh, my mom recently bought a pair. So yeah, no discounts for family. <laughs> even. Uh, my mom bought a pair and she is, she's 70 years old and exercise has never come easy to her. And she really didn't exercise much until about two years ago. And, you know, she would be, you know, she's in this like overweight category is on medication to manage blood sugar and, you know, was definitely headed down a really bad path. And she decided she, you know, I, she watches me lift all the time. She fortunately got clued into like, okay, I got it. I got to try this. So anyway, she's been doing it, but you know, I've gone to some of her sessions with her trainer who is fantastic, but my mom's just not pushing it. She's not willing to like, you know, the second that it would feel hard, she'd back off. And then she needed to do this like very extended rest. So anyway, she got a pair of narwhal a couple of weeks ago, started using them and she just, can immediately feel this difference where she before she'd do four minutes on the treadmill and need 10 minutes of rest. Now she's four minutes on, two minutes off, four minutes on, and she can just keep going. And it's that first set feeling, which you talked to about a little bit earlier in the beginning. It's like this freshness that just keeps, that just sticks with you. And she's now walking on a treadmill further than she's ever gone. She's increasing weight on her sets, which was she was not doing. And it doesn't feel as hard. And it's interesting, there has been one very small study uh, that was a, presented as a poster session. It, I definitely think this is an area of, of research that we I hope to see more research in. But um, uh, basically they, they looked at uh, women who were obese and sedentary and they were using palm cooling to see if they could get more work volume um, from, from them. And this was a 12 week period. And the women who used palm cooling compared to the women who didn't were able to 
significantly improve their distance on a one uh, or their time, sorry, on a one and a half mile walk test. Their resting blood pressure dropped significantly, whereas the other group did not have any significant change. Um, they saw a greater uh, waist circumference reduction, so many benefits. So basically, there is this phenomenon that I didn't know about until recently called exercise intolerance. It, you find it in people who are you know, returning to fitness and are overweight, perhaps, as well as in people who are dealing with um, you know, serious conditions like Hashimoto's and others that Exercise causes excessive overheating to the point where they just can't do it. They can't continue. And so I think that the implications of the, the, the potential impact of palm cooling for these types of populations is really exciting because, yeah, to your point, you don't have to do as much as you think. You don't have to go to the gym seven hours a week to get really exciting health benefits. So we're, we're pumped to see where this can go. And I think that to that point, you know, of not, we talk about our brand and not being bro-y, we, we want everyone from the best player in the NHL to someone who's 70 years old and trying to get the benefits of exercise for themselves, feeling welcomed, feeling like this is for them. It's not just for the elite athlete. It can have its place for many different protocols for many different uses. And we're not sitting there being like, well, if you're not going extreme, you know, that's just not who we are. Yeah, I mean, I'm involved with this uh, red light therapy company called Wave. Uh, you know, Megan Martin's the, the founder, and, and I have a, a piece of the company. And the big turning point was, you know, I might jump in a sauna. I have a good relationship with discomfort. Like, I've, I've gone through it. I've survived. It's, it's made me better in a lot of ways. You know, Ariel, Evie, you might be the type to jump in a cold tub. That, those are really daunting spaces for people who are not in touch with their, their fitness. And, you know, very similarly, I kind of lump uh, the palm cooling into this category. It's like slightly uncomfortable. Like it, it, it's, it's holding something cold, you know, which, you know, I'm fine with it. For some people, maybe it's a little bit more. My wife, uh, for example, has Raynaud's. Like she might be a little bit more sensitive to the cold. Um, but We've uh, my with multiple people with Raynaud's, by the way. Interesting. Yeah. And doing in terms of how. Uh, that are athletes, surprisingly multiple climbers, uh, very good elite climbers have Raynaud's. It's, it's huh. And it's more common in women than in men. And as long as you are exercising, so yeah, you wouldn't want to hold these just sitting around, but if you're holding these once you're getting warm, there doesn't appear to be in our limited experience working with some people with Raynaud's, an issue with them triggering an event. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. But so, so again, very, very similarly, like uh, my mother-in-law, I gave her, I, I gifted her one of these, you know, red light machines and all you do is stand in front of it, you know, with your, your bare skin to the red light. Like there's no discomfort, right? Uh, there, there's no hot, there's no cold. It doesn't hurt. Um, and she noticed like the, the dopamine upregulation, her mood was better. She's convinced, absolutely convinced. Um, you know, she's, uh, you know, an older woman than I, uh, than my wife. She's her mom, obviously, um, you know, very in tune with the, the wrinkle, you know, state, her skincare, like she's totally set on this, you know, helping her. And so, you know, I, I really had the conversation with, um, you know, Megan around, you know, this is very encouraging. Like the, when, when people from the, you know, quote, I don't, and I don't mean this, uh, you know, as a less than term, but like, you know, from the general population who are, you know, maybe non-competitive athletes, um, I'm really intrigued that things in and around personal wellness and fitness that there's just a, a lower barrier to entry uh, for them. And, and it, it tends to be, you know, fitness, you both know this is very momentum based. You wake up, you have that first workout, every meal of the day becomes easier. You're more bought into, you know, getting outside, like, like life just becomes, um, you, you have this forward lean, you know, and when you're able to kind of set the first domino in effect. So whatever can get people to the gym, whatever can, um, you know, help them feel better. I, I'm always, uh, you know, very interested in, I mean, that was, I've been a pro, this will be my 11th year. Uh, I've tried everything under the sun and, and part of that is just to keep it fun, you know, keep it interesting. And so, you know, I've really enjoyed my Norwals and, um, and this conversation as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great, great to talk. Yeah. All right. Well, um, and, and to, to finish up, Evie, there's a, um, Friend of mine, Dr. Stephanie Estima, she has a, a podcast out of, out of Toronto. She's a, um, she consults, have, she was a chiropractor. She consults heavily. I'm forgetting her specialties. This is horrible. Um, 
to women over 40, uh, but she, again, is also a adult lover and, and physique lover and talks a lot about, you know, sort of how to train for the hourglass uh, figure while also, you know, maximizing bone density and, you know, some of the issues that uh, aging women have. Uh, she's a beast in the gym, so I'm going to share the podcast with her and, and maybe uh, connect you offline uh, with Dr. Steph because she's always uh, looking for new um, gym hacks. She trains like I do. She's a, a diesel, so... That's amazing. Oh, I would, love, I would absolutely love to meet her. And just vibe wise, I think you guys would hit it off in terms of, you know, she has a heavy science background. You both do. Uh, I'll have to Google some of the words you dropped, um, you know, about the enzymes here today. Uh, that might take me a second or third time. And I, wa I was good in school. I was not a dumb jock, but uh, you guys are over my head a little bit today. But You could always ask us too. And yeah. <laughs> We, we, yeah, I'll just refer. We ran our Instagram pretty religiously. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. And I actually did see Evie the the post about your mom, and and I thought that that was awesome, um, and totally makes sense. I mean, you know, exercise and feeling sore and getting hot. These are you know very scary things for people who don't you know go into those zones regularly. So, yeah. um, the water's fine. You know, us yeah. a little bit further down the path are happy to help. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean, I think I come at some things from you know, I'm, I'm a fair bit older than you. And it's just, as you get older, you're looking for those levers like, oh, how can I improve my sleep? How can I improve my nutrition? How can I, oh, here's this sauna thing, or here's this cold therapy thing. And you play with these different levers because, you know, certain things get tougher, <laughs> certain things hurt more, you know, whatever it is. So. Yeah, absolutely. Even, you know, I'm coming up on 30 this year and, and, uh, <laughs> definitely can relate. <laughs> Definitely can relate where, you know, certain ways I would feel earlier in my career from certain training intensities or volumes. It's, it's just different. I wouldn't say. Uh, or I'm sure what you could get away with, right? When you were 21, you could go be out with your buddies a little later. You could pay a little less attention to your sleep and maybe you, you would have been more optimized, but you didn't realize it. Right. And I, I didn't understand the cost of, of extra, right? Like I used to stare at my exercise program and consider it like a suggestion. Like, oh, this is a good way, place to start. And then I would do it and just do whatever the fuck I wanted after like all sorts of extra jumps and extra conditioning and do it like seven days a week. And I'm like, there's no training effect here. I'm just, I'm just inducing stress. Like there's no adaptation occurring. I'm just doing busy work. And now as I get older, I'm like, you know, I, I hear the quote champions do extra. It's like, yeah, I, I get that. It's, it's usually they do extra recovery or <laughs> you know, extra preparation. So their, their actual core of their work is better. Yeah. They're not necessarily doing extra sets, like the extras in the intention, the extras in the preparation beforehand, the extra anyway. So yeah. I really appreciate both your time. This was fun. Uh, where can people uh, find you on Instagram and if they want to reach out uh, either, you know, via your website uh, to order a Norwal or to learn more information? Yeah, we are apexcoolabs.com and apexcoolabs on all of the major social channels. I do want to share too, I've never been a sticker on my computer guy until you guys sent me your sticker and I like your logo. So you guys, alongside Element actually, Evie, I think it's serendipitous that you say that, uh, are the two stickers, only stickers. I don't know if my wife knows it yet because we share a computer, but my <laughs> lap, I'm, I'm officially a sticker on the laptop guy. Oh, well, that, we love that. That makes our day. As Yeah, we're definitely, you know, wrapping. I, we, have, yeah. we have it everywhere. I love it. I we love really it. Hey, like our logo. I, just, you yeah. have a you have a great logo. I, I and giving you know a lot of the climbing, like the the mountain vibe and and all that, and being from Colorado, it's uh, it's sharp. You did well. Cool. Yeah, we'll share that with our amazing designer. Designer, yeah. Now. Good, good deal. Well, thank you both for your time, and I hope you have a great uh, dealt workout after this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Connor. Bye, guys.